By creating new tools made from inorganic materials, such as metals, ceramics, and semiconductors, we can help solve important problems that we face in the world around us. This has been true since the time of our early ancestors, who fashioned simple stone tools for hunting and protection. And since that time, materials have evolved through the stone, bronze, and iron ages to the modern age of silicon technology. And this now provides us with an amazing array of electronic devices and capabilities. But at the same time, we've created new problems for ourselves. These problems stem in part from the requirement for high temperature processing conditions, from the use of toxic substances in our materials, such as lead and mercury in circuit boards, for example. And most critical for the future of our planet are the problems we face due to our dependence on the burning of fossil fuels to power our electrical infrastructure. I believe that a key resource for powering the future of technology and solving many of these pressing challenges can be found in the natural process of biological evolution. This process has led to the formation of the most important inorganic tool that has pushed all technological progress forward the bones within our hands. Our bones, along with other biominerals, such as teeth and seashells, are very complex inorganic materials encoded by DNA. Since Watson and Crick pieced together the structure of DNA 50 years ago, the tools of molecular biology have come under the purview of our technological progress. And with current capabilities in synthetic biology, we can now harness nature's biomolecular orchestra to quickly evolve high-performing and environmentally friendly new materials. These materials will underpin a useful new class of tools and devices that I call genetically evolved technology. So this technology will utilize DNA as a starting point. Large populations of materials will be grown in the laboratory and only the fittest materials, for example, only the materials with the most efficient electronic properties, only those materials will be selected for genetic reproduction. Now, this approach has several advantages over current methods, and one of these advantages is the low temperatures at which the materials can be formed. These are examples of skeletons from two different sea sponges. These biominerals are, in many ways, more complex than our technological materials. The structure on the right here is composed of fiberglass-like skeletal elements that are like micro-cables woven and cemented together to form this basket-like pattern. And both of these structures are formed from glassy silica. This is one of the main materials found in many computer chips as a dielectric material. But instead of the hundreds and thousands of degrees that we need to make technological silica, these grow in ocean water. Through molecular biology work in the lab of Dan Morris at UC Santa Barbara, where I studied for my PhD, a key gene was discovered that encodes these needle-like skeletal elements in this image on the left. This gene has since been used to create new materials in the laboratory. For example, the bio-artist Joe Davis and co-workers inserted this gene into bacteria and used its material-producing properties to produce a functional bacterial radio. Now, this radio functions on the same principle as a normal radio, and it has metal components, even though it's made from bacterial building blocks. Other work, such as the research of Angela Belcher and co-workers, have shown that viruses can be used to build batteries in solar cells. Collectively, these examples prove that biomolecules can be used to build inorganic-based electronic devices. And this now opens the opportunity to more fully embrace DNA's main advantage, which I think is captured nicely by Thomas Edison's quote, I have not failed, I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work. Trial and error is an essential aspect of innovation. The more we try, the more we increase our chances for success. And this is the key to genetically evolved technology. With synthetic biology, starting from a single strand of DNA, we can create a large population of millions of variations of that DNA, therefore creating a gene pool where each individual gene in the population is slightly different from all the rest. We can create this DNA diversity easily so that all these millions of molecules of DNA are present in the same small drop of water. 
So in this simple format, we can take this drop of water and put it in a laboratory environment with specific conditions so that each gene in the population, simultaneously with all the others, will have a try at growing a new material. So we go through this process of trial and error incredibly rapidly, exploring millions of materials, if we'd like, in a small drop of water. But which material is best? Well, that depends on the use that we're interested in. As Darwin reminds us, the key is humanity's power to a cumulative selection. Nature gives successive variations, and humans add them up in certain directions useful to them. Here, Darwin was speaking about the domestication of animals, for example, going from a wolf to dogs. We can breed dogs in many different ways. Well, which breed is best? Well, that depends on what we want from that faithful relationship. We can gradually select different breeds depending on whether we want a hunting dog or a frisbee dog or an intellectual dog <laughs> or just a little ball of cute.、Um, <laughs> And similarly, in genetically evolved technology, we can select for different materials depending on the selection performance, the criteria that we we set in the laboratory. So, in my PhD work at UCSB, I set up a test system where we grew new gene encoded materials in the laboratory. We utilized the gene that encodes these silica needles from sponges as our starting point. So this was our proverbial wolf gene, and we used this gene to grow silica in tiny drops of water, and this produced silica spheres. And the background here is just the net that catches the silica material. So next, we wanted to prove that we could evolve a new gene that encodes a very different type of inorganic structure. Starting with our wolf gene, we created a large population of DNA cousins. We took this genetic population and put it in a laboratory environment with specific environmental pressures that we designed, and these pr pressures ensured that only materials with a specific structure would survive and allow their encoding genes to be reproduced. Now, the experimental details of this process of laboratory selection are very technical, and here I just want to show the result. We evolved a new gene that. When used to grow silica in small drops of water, produced a structure made of tiny silica nanoparticles separated from one another on a sheet of protein. So、um, this particular material does not have direct electronic applications, but it represents the first time that new inorganic material structure has been directly genetically evolved in the laboratory. It proves. That the techniques that we need for evolving a wide variety of materials are now readily available to us. Now we can begin changing laboratory conditions and designing new selection pressures to direct the evolution of materials to build, in principle, any type of technological device that we're interested in. We can evolve materials for better batteries, solar cells, or environmental sensors, and perhaps one day evolve computer chips and new types. Of electronic infrastructure, we can change the chemical environment of evolution in the laboratory, feeding in safe and widely available metals. We can select from thousands of genes in nature as starting points, pulling from the fascinating magnetic, optical, and structural biominerals that we already find in nature. We can change the laboratory environment, creating unique、uh, environments to evolve specific, different types of devices. As I already mentioned, the experimental details of the selection process we used are very technical. But I want to share with you just a brief glimpse of a rapidly developing technique that can be used to create new micro environments for materials evolution. With droplet-based microfluidics, we can produce water and oil droplets in microfluidic channels that are the width of a human hair. We can produce these droplets at rates of thousands per second and utilize each droplet as an artificial material-producing cell. Starting with our diverse gene pool, we can separate individual genes into unique droplets and thereby grow different materials and unique artificial cells. We have the potential for building 
circuitry around these droplet streams to measure the materials-based electronic performance from each drop, measuring tens of thousands of droplets per second, and selecting for replication only the highest performing materials. This is a concept. We can change that light bulb with your favorite device. And I want to emphasize that the techniques we need for building these types of platforms requires no new leap in technology. We have the tools right now for building these types of systems, and we're working in that direction at the University of Leeds with collaborators. But broadly realizing the full societal potential of genetically evolved technology will require new bridges be built between material scientists, molecular biologists, and a variety of engineers and industries. And similar to the development of synthetic biology, the participation of policymakers and humanitarian thinkers will be essential to have mature discussions on this new approach to technology. With such new connections, we can build significant and hopeful new bridges between today and tomorrow. The world that we live in today is vastly different from the world of the past. A hundred years ago, we didn't require, as a matter of survival, new materials for carbon dioxide sequestration or solar fuel production, but our environment has changed, and we must adapt. With genetically evolved technology, we can quickly build effective materials for critical challenges, including water purification, carbon dioxide sequestration, solar fuel production and storage, and many, many others. Together, we can solve the problems that we face as individuals and as a species. That is in our DNA. Thank you.